Today is a review of the book Healing Multiple Sclerosis by Anne Baruch, who is a certified nutrition consultant who believed that overgrowth of candida, a yeast within the gastrointestinal tract, was the cause of multiple sclerosis and could be treated with antifungal treatments and with a specific diet along with other recommendations. I should give as a conflict of interest that I'm a traditionally trained doctor and potentially biased against alternative treatments, but I'll try to be as fair as possible. We're going to review a little bit about her life and the treatments she recommends, and at the end I'll give my personal opinion. By the way, I'm Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. So a little bit about the history of Anne Baroque. She was born in 1965, and she notes that she had a very stressful childhood. In 1968, when she was only three, her parents divorced. She was also very ill as a child. She had a lot of colds, ear, and sinus infections, impetigo, which is a skin infection, and she had many courses of antibiotics antibiotics, which is important because she believes that antibiotics clean out the sort of good bacteria within your gastrointestinal tract and can contribute to growth of candida, which is of course generally medically accepted. She also was a sugaraholic. She had a really poor diet and she actually had 15 amalgam fillings. This could be important for two reasons. One, sugar is a source of candida growth, and she also believes that amalgams, which contain mercury, could be toxic and contribute to her problem as well. When she was 19, she developed mononucleosis or glandular fever, which is an infection known to be associated with multiple sclerosis risk. Those who have this disease have double the risk of multiple sclerosis. I have a separate video on Epstein-Barr virus if you want to take a look. At age 24 in 1989, she actually started to become ill. She had a panic attack while in a restaurant with a friend, and she had convulsions. It's a little bit unclear exactly what happened to her. Based on her description in the book, she may have had what is known as non-epileptic seizures, although it's not 100% clear. She also had other neurological symptoms such as numbness and speech difficulty, and after testing, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and her symptoms persisted for months and months. Now, she was interested in alternative medicine, and so she actually saw an a medical intuitive who diagnosed her with candida overgrowth, and she read the book The Yeast Connection by Dr. William Crook, who was one of the early proponents of the idea that yeast overgrowth could contribute to various diseases, and this has become somewhat popular over the years. And so she took Nystatin, which is an antifungal agent, and she changed her diet, and she actually improved. Now, she later developed some worsening symptoms, which some difficulty swallowing, which was possibly like stress, anxiety related, and she became very ill and actually moved back in with her mother and later attempted suicide at age 27 and she tried to slash her wrists and she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and later discharged to a halfway house. But she started to improve and she sort of stuck to her plan. And she later went back to school to become a naturopath and a hypnotherapist. And then she opened up a private practice in 1998. She actually opened up her practice in Los Angeles, which is where I am, but I've never met her personally. And she later uh, became an iridologist, who is, which is an alternative medicine practice of studying the iris, as you can see to the right side and making diagnoses based on that and a certified nutrition consultant and she reported that she was free of MS symptoms for over 20 years in 2017 she unfortunately passed away but a lot of people still follow her program and read her books now, according to her, the cause of multiple sclerosis is overgrowth of the yeast candida albicans within the gastrointestinal tract. And to the right, you can see what candida looks like under the microscope. Now, candida can cause various diseases in humans. Some of the most common things would be thrush, which is sort of the flaky white things in your mouth. This can happen in young babies or people who are immunosuppressed with HIV, taking immunosuppressant drugs. I've seen it many, many times in my career. It's also the cause of vaginal yeast infections, which about 75% of women will have at some point in their lifetime. So candida is very common, and it actually is normal for candida to be present within the gastrointestinal tract uh, to some extent. But basically, you have sort of good bacteria that are out-competing the candida so they never overgrow. But with antibiotics, weakening of the immune system, and other factors, you can actually get this overgrowth of candida, and there are actually toxins that the fungus can release, known as mycotoxins, which can cause various problems. And there's this thought that there's sort of a dysbiosis, or dysregulation of the gastrointestinal tract, which could damage the wall of the GI tract and cause increased permeability, known as leaky gut syndrome. And this is thought to potentially contribute to many autoimmune diseases, because the immune system is 
exposed to foreign proteins that are supposed to be degraded and metabolized within the gastrointestinal tract. Now, what in turn causes candida? Well, the main thing she talks about is diet, in particular sugar, but also other refined carbohydrates that are turned into sugar. She also thinks that heavy alcohol use could be a factor, along with things like air pollution and illicit drugs, and of course antibiotics, which clear out the good bacteria, steroids like prednisone and solumedrol, which weaken the immune system, along with steroid hormones. Now, many of these things are generally medically accepted to be causes of candida, like antibiotics use, steroids, steroid hormones, weakening of the immune system, for instance. She also talks about heavy metals, especially dental amalgams, the silver fillings, and I have a separate video about that if you want to take a look about mercury and multiple sclerosis, and also chemotherapy, radiation, and she's also against vaccinations. So she describes the cycle where you get infections, you're treated with antibiotics, they clean out the good bacteria, that allows candida to overgrow, the mycotoxins weaken the immune system, and then you get further infections. And then there are downstream consequences of this, like this leaky gut syndrome, which causes the release of mycotoxins into the body, which can cause damage to various organs and cause various diseases, not just multiple sclerosis. Now, what are her recommendations? Well, the main thing is this anti-Canada diet, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a second. Even though she's an alternative medicine practitioner, she's actually a proponent of antifungal prescription medications, at least at the beginning. She recommends various vitamins and supplements, detoxification and avoidance of various toxins, along with exercise, stress management, and challenging self-limiting uh, beliefs, which she thinks is very important. She has quite a large section in this book on psychology. Now, to go over her diet in a little bit more detail, I would say this is most similar to the Best Bet Diet or the MS Hope Diet, which are proposed by Matt and Ashton Embry. And I have a review of the video in Living Proof by Matt Embry that sort of talks about his diet. Now, the main differences between the MS Hope diet and her diet is that they allow caffeine, but she does not. And also, they recommend avoidance of dairy, which she does as well, although she allows a few exceptions, such as ghee, for instance, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the basics of the diet are no refined sugar, that's the main thing, no dairy or wheat or gluten, because these are potential allergens, avoid refined grains, though whole grains are okay, avoid trans fats and red meats and yeast containing or fermented foods such as kombucha because of course the whole idea is you want to avoid fungus so anything that could potentially be contaminated by fungus she also recommends avoiding caffeine and alcohol now if you're intolerant to certain foods you should avoid them and she talks about some common food allergens like corn soy citrus fruits chocolate egg and nightshade vegetables although they're not strictly prohibited she's against artificial sugars as well although she allows low amounts of stevia and xylitol so basically what you would eat is primarily organic vegetables, about 60% of your diet, 20% animal products, chicken, turkey, duck, and fish, but no red meat, so only about 4 ounces daily, 15% gluten-free whole grains, and about 5% fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, and non-refined oils, such as olive oil. And the reason for limiting the fruit is just because of the sugar content. You would also drink adequate water. So the animal products you could eat would be things like organic chicken and turkey, wild-caught fish. Now, to go into a little bit more detail, the vegetables she advocates for are dark leafy greens, sprouts, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower. She prefers raw over cooked vegetables because of higher micronutrient content. And she's kind of against starchy vegetables such as corn, peas, and potatoes because they're metabolized. Getting paged here. They're metabolized into sugar, and for the first three months, she advises you be especially cautious with potential food allergens, so she suggests you avoid nightshade vegetables like eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers, and beans and legumes for the first three months, but if they're not causing a problem, you could reintroduce them at a later time. And some other things, like I said, she does allow ghee, which is clarified butter, basically pure butter fat, which doesn't contain lactose, and small amounts of unsalted grass-fed organic butter. You should avoid moldy fruits because they could potentially be contaminated with yeast. And although refined salt is not acceptable, getting paged again, sea salt and Himalayan salt are okay. Now, as I said, she's actually a proponent of antifungal prescription medication, despite being an alternative medicine practitioner. And usually we would treat 
things like oral thrush for a relatively brief period of time. For instance, the drug nystatin, which is an antifungal agent that you generally swish and swallow, you would usually only take it for two weeks after the thrush or the flaky white things in your mouth disappear. But she recommends a longer treatment, such as one to two years, which is quite a long time and is somewhat unusual. Now, nystatin is relatively safe, though some of these other agents, such as diflucan, can rarely cause liver problems, particularly if you take them for a prolonged period of time. She's also a proponent of herbal antifungal treatments and I should note that she has the supplement company ABX so she does have a little bit of a conflict of interest there and she does recommend her own products throughout the book although she talks about some other options as well now this has actually been studied in clinical trials a little bit this was a randomized trial in the New England Journal of Medicine about candidus hypersensitivity syndrome and various different symptoms it could be causing and in this randomized study for 32 weeks there was no statistically significant difference although there may have been a slight trend towards superiority of the antifungal medication nystatin but again no statistically significant difference and of course this is just the antifungal treatment not her entire program which as far as I know has never been formally tested now, she also recommends various supplements such as vitamin C, E, and vitamin D3, B-complex vitamins, fish oil, primrose, primrose oil. She talks about various potential chelating agents such as red clover tea because of the mercury, along with L-carnitine and grapeseed extract. And she also recommends probiotics as long as they are dairy-free. And a lot more, these are just some examples. Now, she talks about the potential toxin load, which could be contributing to diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So she recommends removing dental amalgams. And I have a separate video again on mercury and the potential connection to multiple sclerosis. She recommends consuming organic foods and avoiding GMOs or genetically modified food. And she also suggests you kind of reduce your exposure to potential toxins overall, like by using natural cleaning products and fabrics and things like that. And she recommends air and water purifiers. Now, a lot of her book is dedicated to psychology, and she attributes a lot of her problems to her sort of traumatic childhood and her emotional problems, and she thinks that she was very harsh on herself and very self-judgmental, so she advises you to sort of avoid such self-judgment, to give yourself this sort of unconditional love, and rather than avoiding fears and insecurities, to sort of accept them and try to confront them. But she also recommends taking responsibility for yourself and managing your own illness and sort of being optimistic and forward thinking and if you have self-limiting beliefs and low self-confidence to sort of question this and try to reorient yourself with self affirmations in the mirror and other techniques and she also talks a little bit about spirituality it's a very good section of the book and some other things she mentions are avoiding animal products raised with hormones and antibiotics. And she talks about how some people that she treats may temporarily worsen. They may feel worse after they start the antifungal treatment or the diet. And she thinks this is due to the death of the candida and the sort of disturbance of the gastrointestinal tract, which later resolves. And she talks about a few other alternative treatments, such as skin brushing, which is thought to sort of move the lymphatic fluid around to sort of uh, move things around and clear out toxins along with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And she talks about how she had this sort of psychological fear of swallowing where she felt that she was choking on her own food and she did hypnotherapy, which was effective to her, and she later trained to be a hypnotherapist. And she talks about the benefits of high quality sleep and meditation. Now, I like a lot of aspects of the book. The first part of the book, she talks about her own experiences and she's extremely open and personal. She's a very good writer. The book is well organized and she really has not just general suggestions, but also a very impressive list of foods you can eat and cannot eat and some sample meals and recipes and a very well done section on different supplements and different supplement manufacturers that you can take. So if you really wanted to implement this program, everything is there in the book for you. And I think perhaps a very underrated aspect of the book is the section on psychology and mindset, which I think was helpful to her and could be helpful to a lot of people. Now, some critiques on the book, I don't think that she has a lot of interest in multiple sclerosis itself. The section on MS and just explaining what MS is and the different medications is not particularly well done or researched. But to be fair, she proposes the idea of Canada as a general risk factor for various diseases. So the fact that she had multiple sclerosis in particular may not be very relevant. Now, she doesn't have any scientific data to really support her claims, although arguably, 
Obviously, if it works, it doesn't really matter. Now, I would say that her story is a little bit unusual. It's probably not what a typical person with multiple sclerosis would experience. I'm not saying she doesn't have multiple sclerosis or that her treatment doesn't work. It's just a little bit hard to know what to make of that particular anecdote. One thing I would also say is that the sort of science of Canada is a little bit dubious in that there's no specific test for it. And she actually sort of recommends against testing for Canada in most cases because she thinks that even if you test negative, the tests aren't that sensitive. And so she would essentially diagnose you mostly based on your history and other factors. And so one thing that she uses are yeast questionnaires. And I actually took the questionnaire. And according to her, if you score greater than 140, if you're a male, because some of the questions are specifically about female problems, she says yeast connected health problems are almost certainly present. So I took the questionnaire, I scored 217, and I'm a relatively healthy person. So it's a little bit silly. And if you sort of look at the questionnaire, this the questionnaire, this is not from her book, but just from another source. Do you feel tired most of the time? Do you have intestinal discomfort, bloating, constipation? Do you crave sugar? Obviously, these are things that could occur in almost anyone. And on this particular questionnaire, if you score greater three, three or more, yes. Uh, then you would be you know positive for yeast so it's a little bit dubious anyways if you have any questions or comments please post below if you follow this program i'd be interested to know about what you implemented and what your results are and if you have any suggestions for future videos please post in the comments below